so nice to see some familiar faces out there. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, we're gonna have a wild ride this afternoon. It's gonna be fun. So I'm gonna go ahead and start screen sharing and we're gonna, oh, and if you have any questions while it's going on, I can't see you even. So if you raise your hand, I can't see that. So uh, just go ahead and put your questions in the chat and we'll try and answer them all at the end of the, okay. Okay, so, um, so I, first of all, I was just gonna say, uh, I actually uh, am an artist as well and I do photo collage. And so I've become very interested in the last few years in photo collage. Um, this is the definition of photo collage and of collage in general. And these are the definitions from the Tate Art Gallery. But what, what I found in my research is that these um, definitions are sort of interchangeable and different people use different definitions for different things. But the basic thing is a collage is, describes both the technique and the resulting work of art in which pieces of paper, photographs, fabric, and other ephemera are arranged and stuck down on a supporting surface. That's the ba basic name of collage. A photo montage is a collage constructed from photographs. Uh, papier collé is something we're going to talk about, and it's basically just a collage made of paper. And digital photo composition, which we'll talk about at the end, uh, does not involve glue. Obviously, it involves either uh, darkroom techniques or um, Photoshop. So it's also called photo montage or composite photography. Today, we're going to talk about uh, sort of the origins of photo collage. Victorian photo collage, which is going to be surprising, I think, to you, all of you. Uh, cubism and surrealism, pop art, the evolution of collage in the 20th century, some of my favorite digital collage artists, and then I'm going to end with some resources. Uh, I just want to say this is not a comprehensive study. The history of photo collage basically sort of mirrors the, or, or sort of goes alongside the history of of art. So there's so much photo collage uh, going back to the 20th century. Uh, I couldn't put it all in this one hour talk. So uh, I'm going to just start with this, which is actually a screen, which is decoupage. So decoupage actually predates uh, sort of photo collage. Uh, it, this is a screen from the 19th century. Um, and for those who don't know what decoupage is, it's the art of decorating an object by gluing colored paper cutouts onto it in a combination with special paint effects, gold leaf, or decorative elements. Used commonly, it's an object like a small box or an item of furniture. So the word decoupage comes from the middle French decoupé, meaning to cut, very simple. And artisans in France, I mean, sorry, in Florence, Italy, started doing this actually as soon as the 18th century. So it definitely predates photo collage. Here is the one of the earliest examples we have of actual just collage. And um, this comes from the 1850s and it's made up of advertisements from the newspaper. But it, I put it in here because it's really interesting because it sort of creates a, a domestic scene. And I want you to remember this later on as these interiors and domestic scenes are replicated later in photo collages. Um, it also, uses magazines and pop culture, which will become an integral part of collage during the 20th century. Here is Victorian photo collage, which I think will surprise you all, as it surprised me as well. Um, these, this little figure on the right here is, is painted, and then these are actual photographs that have been pasted down onto this picture. So we think of surrealists as having invented collage in the early part of the 20th century, but it was actually Victorian women who were the first to practice photo collage. By the 1860s, these carte de visites, a little two and a half by four inch cardboard calling card with a photo on them were becoming cheap enough for anyone to buy them. And British aristocratic women with time on their hands and a desire to show off their connections and relations began creating albums using these, these little photos in very creative ways. These leather bound photo albums showed off the individual compositions and could be seen as part of a greater narrative about family the and the pastimes of women who were part of the British upper class. These albums functioned not only as a pastime, but they played an important role in society and courtship rituals. Showing off the albums to potential suitors allowed a couple to sit side by side on a couch and showed off the artistic prowess and aptitude of the female creator. 
What is remarkable though, is that these albums challenge the notion of photography just one generation after its creation, as you will see. So just to jump back, this is what a carte de visite looks like, literally translates in French as a visiting card. It was invented in 1854 by André Adolphe Eugène Desideri, who created a camera with four lenses and a plate holder. This allowed for eight identical negatives and possibly several different poses for a sitter. The images became very inexpensive to reproduce and soon became available to the middle class. Here's the camera that he invented with the four lenses. And here's the results, which could be printed, eight images could be printed on a single sheet. And as you can see, you could either have the same pose and with the same people, or you could change and have different people or different poses. The carte de visites themselves generally contained information about the photographer and his address. So I'm sure you've all seen these little uh, cardboard cards. This one actually has the name of the sitter, which is Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales. This fad really caught on in England of carte de visites in 1860, when a photographer named Mayal published the Royal Album, which consisted of 14 carte de visites of the royal family. These noblemen had barely ever been seen by ordinary citizens and soon photographs of statesmen, actors, opera singers, and other important people could be bought and collected by everyone. This is actually a close up of the Royal Album. So everyone began buying albums and filled them with their family and friends as well as famous people. And this meant that every, anyone could invent a social circle as they say, it was sort of the Facebook of its day. And you also had a card basket in the hall of your house where visitors would drop their cards and you could look through them when you were waiting for people and you could see what kind of company they kept. But back to the Victorian photo collage. So these albums were not thought of as artistic photo collages until Elizabeth Siegel, the curator at the Art Institute of Chicago, created the exhibition Playing with Pictures, the Art of Victorian Photo Collage, and showed how incredible and creative these photo collages are. It is thought that perhaps these photo collages, which were made by aristocratic women, they were made like this in order to distinguish themselves from the ordinary albums made by the middle class, as well as to show, show off their painting and decorative skills. They certainly showed off their imagination as well, as evidenced by this web of friends and relations here, as well as somebody whose head is on, on the spider there. One of the albums that we're going to be looking at, and which that last image came from, is uh, were made by this woman who is Lady Mary Georgina Caroline Filmer. Here she is in about 1861. The Filmer album shows a number of photos of Lady Filmer with famous people in very creative scenes, and here is one of them. For this collage, Lady Filmer placed her own portrait. She's the one by the table here in the center. And she, so she could gaze at the Prince of Wales, who's the guy with the hat on. Meanwhile, she put her husband, who's much smaller, on a little chair next to the dog. She painted the rest of the scene and put in these little photos above, you know, to make up paintings above and she put somebody behind the fireplace. And it was this very nice domestic scene. She also, as you can see, she set up a new social order and displayed herself making, making the album at the same time. Once photos were cut from their original surroundings, it appears something deeper and darker was set loose. You could turn your best friend into an acrobat. You could transfer and form a neighbor into a bubble, a duck, or the handle of an umbrella. You could splay the bodies of loved ones onto fans or get them stuck in webs. Uh, and the question is, was this just class rivalry or social aspirations or what, what drove the women to make these sort of crazy surreal scenes? The answer is that there were two sources that probably uh, were the inspiration for these. One is Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, which was published in 1865. And you can see the toadstools here and the little girl and these sort of fantastical animals. And the other thing that was uh, sort of around at that time was Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, which came out in 1859. 
The photo collages, it seems, were especially taken with Lewis Carroll's stories of playing cards coming to life. And in this picture, they used their paper, she used her paper, knives, glue, and watercolors to replace the kings, queens, and jacks in the deck with the heads of aristocrat aristocrats they knew, giving their friends a nice social bump. Here's a page from a French woman named Madame B's album in which she's put human faces peering out from the eyes of the butterfly wings. The collages loved living puns, strange substitutions and scale anomalies. What is amazing is that this is surrealism 70 years before the surrealists. It is photo montage 60 years before the Dadaists did it in Berlin and it is collage 50 years before the cubists supposedly invented it in France. Not all the albums were so crazy and inventive, but this is a beautiful album that I thought I would show uh, by someone named Emily Claire Harvey, who did a great, a great job of combining the sitter with his or her personal likes and hobbies. Here's another couple of pages from that album. So now we're going to talk about cubism and collage. So the cubists claim to invent collage, but as we know now, they did not actually invent collage. But um, so somehow Picasso and Brock decided to start using, experimenting with substances in their paintings around 1906. They were putting sand, coffee grounds, and by and painting newspapers and advertisement and lettering and putting lettering in their paintings. This work is the most famous and possibly the first cubist papier collé, a collage made of pasted, just pasted paper. In the summer of 1912, Brock noticed a roll of fake wood wallpaper displayed in a shop window and decided to incorporate pieces of the mechanically printed fake wood grain paper into the series of charcoal drawings he was making. You can just see it up here under the word B, under the B for bar and down at the bottom here is this fake wood wallpaper. Picasso embraced it wholeheartedly and made hundreds of these collages. But interestingly enough, their collage did not include photography for some time. But they apparently established it, Picasso, Brock, and Juan Gris established it as an artistic pra practice. In Russia, the art scene was buzzing with talk of this and here significantly the revolutionary experiments undertaken in art were a collab collaboration between writers and visual artists. Here's Kazmir Malevich, who is Russian, his woman at a poster column from 1914. He's added words, various words into his collage as well. Kurt Schwitters uh, made a significant contribution to the collage art and he started making what he called his Mertz works in 1918, M-E-R-Z is Mertz, um, which were paper pictures and shallow relief constructions with all the, he made these with the detritus that he found in the street. Mertz is a nonsense word, which he invented and he used it to describe his collage and assemblage works. Um, so he was part of what's called the Dadaist movement, which for those of you who don't know, consisted of artists who rejected the logic, reason, and aestheticism of modern capitalist society and instead expressed nonsense, irrationality, and anti-bourgeois protest in their works. The art of the movement spanned visual, literary, and sound media, included collage, poetry, cut-up writing, and sculpture. Dadaist artists expressed their discontent towards violence, war, and nationalism, and maintained political affinities with radical left-wing and far-left politics. Here's another pic uh, picture by Kurt Schwitters, who was a key figure of modernism and paved the way for pop art. Another collage artist who became very famous is John Hartfelt, who claimed to have invented photo montage. As you can see, if you claim to invent something, sometimes it works out. Anyway, he said that he was already cutting and pasting photos by 1915, but he named it photo montage because he refused to play the part of an artist. He regarded himself as an engineer and, he, as their work as a con, and his work as a construction, which he assembled. Here is his self-portrait cutting off the head of someone. 
Hartfield was a resident of Berlin until 1933. His vehemently anti-fascist collages appeared on the covers of the AIZ on, news, on newsstands throughout the city. From 1930 to 1933, Hartfield's scathing anti-Nazi montages were clearly visible on Berlin streets. Supporters also pasted posters of his montages on walls and surfaces all over the city. During this time, he created an astounding 240 photo montages And his photo montages of this Nazi period are a feat of political art that has never been duplicated. He lived in Berlin until April 1933 when he narrowly escaped assassination. He fled to, the, to Czechoslovakia where he rose to the number five on the Gestapo's most wanted list. Hannah Hawk is an important name in collage and one of the only women Dada artists in Berlin. Here she is with a creation of hers. She made some of the most iconic works of collage from that period. Apparently, as a child, she made collages. And then in 1918, she started using the childlike technique of replacement, the wrong head on the wrong body, reshuffling images, and, and uh, exploring gender roles in politics. Hulk had worked for a women's magazine called Die Dame and used the magazine to create collages. In her work and others, the violence of the medium ripping and cutting people in half often re reflected the trauma of war and the upheaval of society. As you can see, she played with gender a lot. Uh, this is a work of a man holding a baby and wearing high heels, and she is critiquing societal gender roles. She apparently uh, wrote about the hypocrisy of men in the Dada movement in an essay called The Painter, published in 1920, in which she portrays a modern couple that embraces gender equality in their relationship, a novel and shocking concept for the time. Here's another of her absurd creations that echoes the feelings of war, uh, with clowns partially obscured looking down and a cockroach climbing up a long metal tube that resembles a, can a cannon and people hiding in the cities in the distance. She also suffered from Nazi censorship of her art and her work was deemed degenerate art, which made it more difficult for her to show her work. And so her work was not acclaimed until after the war. She continued to produce her photo montages and exhibit them internationally though until her death in 1978. So surrealism, we're gonna jump into surrealism, which is a cultural movement from the 1920s, which developed in Europe in the aftermath of World War I and was largely influenced by Dada. The movement is best known for its visual artworks and writings and the juxtaposition of distant realities to activate the unconscious mind through, the, through imagery. Surrealist photographers include Man Ray, Marcel Duchamp, Max Ernst, Andre Breton, Versailles, Salvador Dali, Philippe Halsman, Andre Cortez, and Hans Bellmer. Many used collage or montage techniques, but I don't have time to talk about all of them here. So I'm gonna show you Dora Marr, who was a surrealist, whose work really was inspired by collage, as you can see here. Dora Marr was a photographer in her own right, but she has suffered the fate of many female artists as she is often reduced to simply being considered a muse and a model. In 1930, Marr met Picasso in Paris and the pair entered an eight year romantic relationship in which she posed for him many times. During this time, she also met the photographer Versailles with whom she shared a dark room in the studio. She was also involved in many surrealist groups and often participated in demonstrations, convocations and cafe conversations. After she and Picasso split up in the 1940s, she gave up photography and only painted until her death. But both her paintings and her very avant-garde experiments with photograms and darkroom photography were only found posthumously. Another surrealist was Max Ernst, who went to Munich to study with the artist Paul Klee and saw the paintings of Giorgio de Chirico and was inspired to create fantastical images free of narrative, completely irrational and surreal. He began cutting up mail order catalogs, scientific manuals and teaching aids as a way of plumbing his own psyche for inspiration and to confront his own trauma. Max Ernst often blended the visual and words in his collages 
He later escaped to Germany and France before the Second World War and was married to Peggy Guggenheim briefly. Peggy Guggenheim, who I'm gonna talk about in just a second, showed one of the first exhibitions of collages, papier collé and photo montages at her gallery called Guggenheim Jeune in London in 1938, Guggenheim Jeune, sorry. The exhibition included works by Picasso, Jean R. Max Ernst, Ernst Kurt Switters, and others. Here she is in a photograph by Man Ray. She's a very important figure in the 20th century. She aided the careers of many surrealists, helped them to flee Europe and to have careers in New York. In 1942, she opened another gallery called Art of the Century in New York. I have also not talked much about Man Ray, who took this portrait of her, but and he was among the first to create the photo montage or composite images by putting negatives together in the darkroom. His photo montages play with form and perception, as in his multiple exposures here. And he famously invented the photogram or ray rayograph, uh, which was a fabulous collage creation, even though it's not technically collage because it doesn't use glue and you don't paste things down, but it is assembling different disparate objects together. Another surrealist photographer using photo montage was a Bauhaus trained graphic designer who immigrated to New York in 1938 named Herbert Bayer. I just love this image of the, of the hands with the eyes. So collage was the perfect medium for those who claimed allegiance to the pop art movement, which emerged in the 1950s. Pop art is based on modern popular culture and mass media, especially as a critical or ironic comment on traditional fine art values. Joseph Cornell is particularly interesting as a complex shy figure who never had any art education Yet his surrealist assemblage works housed in wooden boxes were to make him one of the most important artists of the 20th century working in collage and assemblage. So again, now we have another term which is assemblage which sort of has to do with the three dimensionality of the collage but it technically is a collage. He made these in a basement in Queens and he mostly out of five and dime objects which he arranged into richly poetic tableaus. Here are more of Joseph Cornell, Cornell's beautiful 3D collages. So I learned this, that apparently pop art emerged in, in the UK in the 1950s and Richard Hamilton is, created with, is credited with inventing it. Again, I think if you say you invented it, maybe you do, I don't know. Uh, he was a very famous artist who was thrown out of the Royal Academy. Um, but in 1956, he completed this first major collage work called Just What it, What Is It That Makes Today's Homes So Different, So Appealing? A seminal image in pop art history. So again, we're dealing with the domestic, the house, and here he is arranging objects in that house in a very ironic and sort of, you know, funny way. He's talking about consumerism. Hamilton went on to teach at the Royal College, which is sort of ironic, and mentored David Hockney. He loved technology and often used the Xerox machine in his work. Um, I'm not gonna talk about technique much in this uh, talk today, um, but because usually it's just paper and glue and photographs, but uh, in this picture in, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that he's used a Xerox uh, picture and he did use some, uh, and often there's paint. I'll talk about that a little bit. So this is his most recognizable work called Study for a Fashion Plate. And this is pretty avant-garde for the time. Here he is, you know, in a, showing a photo studio of the time, but also a partially photographed woman. You know, she's made up of bits and pieces, yet you get the whole picture. So by 1950s, consumerism was in full throttle and Rauschenberg began using it in his work, first as an actual sculptural assemblage and then screen printing the layers of found photographs. I'm a huge Rauschenberg fan, so I love this work. In 
this is another of Rauschenberg's pieces, which, and I showed the person in it to give you a sense of scale. If his work can be summed up in a single word, it is combination. He managed to meld the disparate uh, and put together unlikely objects and techniques. Best known for the making his hybrid painting sculptures, which he called combines, out of litter gleaned from the New York streets. Light bulbs, chairs, tires, umbrellas, street signs, and cardboard boxes were his recurring mo motifs. He was a technical pioneer in multiple disciplines moving re re restlessly on as soon as he mastered a form. Uh, you can see the washboards that are actually pasted into this collage. And again, he's using um, photography, but he's using it as, um, sorry, I'm totally spacing. Uh, he's using screen printing in the, in the picture and well as painting. Here's another one of his combines, uh, which sort of, as I said, they're sort of halfway between sculpture and painting. He also endowed new significance to ordinary objects by placing them in the context of art. So it's a lot of collage, but then it's sort of sculpture. Now we're gonna talk about some 20th century photo collage artists from about 1970 to 2000. I was really introduced to collage through this guy, whose name is Dan Eldon. Dan Eldon was born in London in 1970 to an American mother and a British father. Along with his younger sister, Amy, he and his family moved to Kenya in East Africa in 1977, and Kenya remained his home for the rest of his life. He started creating these journals, which they're collage journals, between the ages of 15 and 22, and he started making more formal journals once he went to college, um, and he began traveling more around Kenya and taking more photographs. He was known as a photographer, of course, at the time. He was a photojournalist. He filled the journals with ephemera from his young life, newspaper clippings, food labels, cards picked up on Lon in London phone books, grain even grains of rice. And the journals are very fragile. They actually uh, are stored now at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Very sadly, Dan was killed in Somalia while he was working as re for Reuters, Reuters fo as a photojournalist when he was just 23. His journals were published posthumously in four volumes. And recently there was a movie made about his life. So this is the book that I had, which was published in 1997. And you can still get this book today. It's a beautiful book of his collages. Here's another page from inside his book. And his work really led me to that of Peter Beard. And I think they must have met at some point and, he, and that Dan was very influenced by him. This is Peter Beard, who is really just a seminal collage artist. Uh, but again, he made these, uh, he made illustrated diaries, which he kept from a very young age. And he, they earned him a central position in, in the international art world. He visited Africa in 1955 and 60, and these trips inspired his lifelong fascination with Africa. His first book was called The End of the Game, and it documented the demise of elephants and black rhinos. It was also during this period that he created his most famous collage works, which depict the destruction of African wildlife. Some of the red in this collage is actually blood. I don't know whose blood, but. Here's another of his photographs from his books. And you can see down in the left-hand corner that he's re-photographed his books. And here is a picture, which I had never seen until recently, of a lot of his diaries. I think he made hundreds and hundreds of them. He was kind of compulsive. He was a bit nutty. He also modeled and acted. And this is him in the top right-hand corner, this Peter Beard there. Uh, sadly, he died uh, a couple of years ago. But he really did some amazing work. Now for something completely different. So uh, the British artist John Steziker studied at the Slade School of Art in 1973 and went on to produce work which challenged the predominance of pop art. His collages are irreverent and his use of glamorous 1950s portraits of dapper suited men and Hollywood stars mashed together with postcards and other faces uh, has the effect of the uncanny. 
stylistically, these were very new at the time. Another artist of the time is named Annegret Soltau, who came from Germany. And she came on the scene in the 19, late 1960s also, and has continued to use photography, collage, performance, and video to challenge representations of the body. She is most notable for her, what she calls her photo sewings, wherein she restitches images of different women together to create new constellations of meaning. There are a lot of artists who do this, who use sewing in their collages, and I don't talk about others. You can find others that you like, but I think she was among the first. Her imagery is both provocative and disturbing and explores themes related to self metamorphosis and the female body. She was a key feminist artist of the 70s along with Cindy Sherman. And of course, David Hockney, who I think you probably all know about, who is an incredibly famous painter, wonderful artist, but he also was a photographer. So, and he made these beautiful collages. Uh, apparently sometime before 1982, he commented that photography is all right if you don't mind looking at the world from the point of view of a paralyzed, paralyzed cyclops for a split second. He didn't like that you could only see one point of view from a photograph. So apparently in around this time, a curator visiting his house in Hollywood forgot some Polaroid film and he started experimenting with it, trying to capture the three dimensions of, of surrounding reality. What arose from these experiments are some of the most stunning composite photographs, photo collages. This one's actually owned by the Getty. I think I've seen it on display there. Uh, this one is just fantastic and it has such a great title. It's called Photo of Annie Leibovitz as she is trying to photograph me. And what I also love about this is that he's sort of expanded the form beyond just the um, square basically. So using images, using photographs throughout, you know, in a random sort of way and also leaving these big patches that are blank. This is about 1983, just by the way. I sort of threw in this artist, uh, his name is Lance Lesher, and he uh, does these incredibly poetic and often playful collages out of found objects, letters, newspaper clippings, books, recipes, and album covers. Um, and he's really into uh, just texture, and these are huge, and he's very into color. Um, and there's a fabulous film about him called The Secret Life of Lance Lesher. He also is obsessive. He makes tons and tons of these and he cuts them just meticulously using a mat knife. Oh, the film is available on Amazon, which I'll talk about later if you want to see it. It's a really fun film. Here's another one of his images. So uh, now we're at the 21st century um, and we are going, I'm just going to select some of my favorites. Well, I have selected some of my favorites to show you and show you a few different methods of collage and sort of where, where collage is today. So Lorna Simpson, you may have heard the name. She's a wonderful photographer. She's also a painter and collage artist. She is well, most well known for her pow powerful artworks that combine photographs with words. And she questions and challenges narrow and conventional ideas about women, culture, and race. Throughout Simpson's practice, the language of hair has played an important role. So in these, in about 2010, she juxtaposed models' heads with swirls of ink to replace their missing hairdos. She uses uh, advertisements from historical copies of Ebony and Jet, the, month, the monthly she says she grew up reading and that informed her sense of thinking about being black in America. What I really love about these is that they're so simple, which is, can be really challenging in collage and yet they're just stunning. She then made a series called Earth and Sky in which she interleaved found pages from 
mineralogical and mineralogical encyclopedia as the hair. She also makes very political lithographs in the style of Rauschenberg with direct messages about race and history. And she paints on them as well, almost, and it almost looks like the ink is bleeding or weeping. This is another of her paintings using ink on photographs and, as well as lithographs, and it's several panels on wood uh, that have been put together. Another incredible collage artist is Michaelin Thomas. Here she is. Uh, she's a contemporary African-American visual artist best known as a painter of complex worlds uh, using, she uses rhinestones, acrylics, and enamel, as well as painting, photography, cutouts. And she is inspired by popular art histories and movements, including Impressionism, Cubism, Dada, and the Harlem Renaissance. Blurring the distinction between object and subject, concrete and abstract, real and imaginary. I just think this is also extraordinary. So this is a woman who is, seems like she is sitting in this collaged environment. And here's another of her collages in which she has actually cut out the woman and put her in the environment. Matt Lips is another incredible collage artist working today. Uh, he has actually used tape across these. You can see the tape that he's used on these photographs, which I think is kind of cool. And he always, there's always shadows in his work. So he's kind of giving them a depth. So he has spent his uh, career focusing on the relationship between sculpture and photography. He uses cut out images he finds in discontinued photographic publications and magazines and arranges these images to create still lives. This is one of his most famous series, which is called the Library Series. And it was created from the 17 volume Library of Photography, an at-home photography primer published in the early 70s by Time Life. So these are all pictures by famous photographers that he's used and he's cut out. He built a structure for them and he puts the cutouts on glass shelves over uh, an enlarged, brightly colored photograph. And then he rephotographs this. In his more recent, more recent series called Looking Through Pictures, he explores the genre of still life in relation to theatrical spaces and productions. Here's one of his, uh, one of the last ones of his photographs I'm going to show, which I just think is extraordinary. Uh, again, he's achieved sort of this three-dimensional space, and his use of color is really uh, just inventive. Catherine de Blauer is another uh, photo collage artist working today, and her work was all over Paris Photo uh, a couple of years ago. She calls herself a photographer without a camera. She collects and recycles pictures and photographs from old magazines and papers. Her work is at the same time intimate, directly corresponding with our unconscious and anonymous, thanks to the use of found images and body parts that have been cut away. In her photographs, her color is almost minimal and abstract. And the way she sort of makes blocks, you almost think of Rothko paintings. Again, I think they're really simple but profound. This is, again, one that I think is just extraordinary, sort of dealing with the geometry of space. And here's the last one which sort of tells a story. She started painting on top of the collages as well and just putting a little stripe of color. One more of hers. Only because I love you can see the edges of the paper that she's torn.
Daniel Gordon is an American photographer who's working now. You may have seen his work. I actually was in Boston a couple of weeks ago and I saw his work uh, actually outside in a, in a display there, which was kind of fun to see. Um, he is best known for producing large color photographs that operate somewhere between collage and still life. He's clearly inspired by Matisse. And when I was doing some research for this, of course, Matisse kept coming up as one of the early collage artists, but he doesn't use photography, so I didn't include him, but it's nice that this is sort of paying homage to Matisse. You can see that he's uses, he's photographed and then used pieces of fruit in his collage. This one makes it a little easier to see the process a little bit more. It's just many, many layers, many layers of illusion. Um, Luther Conadu is another name uh, who recently came to my attention. He's a really incredible collage artist, very young. He is, lives in Canada, but was born in Ghana. And his work almost always involves uh, just his circle of friends. And he does these sort of photographs where you can always see him in the photograph. That's him with the camera. And then he just tapes the other pictures up very simply or paper clips them. This is a self-portrait in which he's used several Xerox pieces to kind of make this collage. Here he is again, there's the tripod in the, in the picture. Again, he's sort of showing you what he's doing, but yet it's still hard to understand exactly how it all came together. Um, and it really, um, I just think they're remarkable. So we've not really talked about film and digital photography montage, which is also called photo collage or composite photography. Again, these terms I think are a bit interchangeable. So Jerry Yulesman, of course, you probably all know, was the early exponent of photo montage. Uh, in the 1970s, he was doing this in the darkroom, putting negatives together to create these sort of surrealistic effects. What I didn't realize is that he was married to Maggie Taylor, who went on to do this in Photoshop, and we'll see some of her work later. I just wanted to mention Dwayne Michaels, who also was playing with uh, double exposures as a way of sort of doing montage. Here's another of his photographs. Um, and he later then started painting. He always wrote on his photographs as well. You know, he'd write titles and he would write his name, but here he also began writing. You can see a bit of the writing and painting on his photographs. And here's a very recent photograph, which is one of his jokes, Marlene measles. So I think her red dot is supposed to be, she's got measles. Here's Maggie Taylor, who I was just talking about. So she became sort of the towering figure in photography in the 1990s because she really understood Photoshop and began creating these uh, unbelievable sort of scenes uh, using scanned images, tin types of 19th century subjects, as well as her imagination. And she created a world that is sim simultaneously of the past and the future. Here's another one of her great images. and another of Maggie Taylor's. I first really became aware of Tom Chambers who was using Photoshop to create these photo montages. Um, he started in about 1998, he said, uh, and he's been doing these, he's got 10 series now of these. And his work is always about man's struggle in the natural and the built world. But as you can see, he's obviously, you know, created this environment and created this woman, uh, you know, photographed her and, and the deer separately and put them together in Photoshop as well as the um, location. I think he often used his children, his dog. I think this is his daughter who's about to jump off a bridge in Venice with pigeons all around her. But he was really adept and Photoshop was really hard in that time. So I can, this is an amazing feat to be able to do this. 
Some of you may know Fran Foreman, uh, who teaches at LACP, and her work started out sort of like Maggie Taylor's using old photographs, but she's since become more contemporary with her use, and she photographs models and spaces. And they're sort of cinematic in their quality, although this one also sort of looks like a hopper painting in terms of the colors. She made some images during COVID and she said, the, finger, the figures in my photo constructions often solitary express the isolation, longing, entrapment, and disconnection in our current lives. She's also used old master paintings though to create, recreate portraits which blur the boundaries between class and status, old and young, fear and joy, whimsy and solemnity sort of bringing the past into the future. Richard Tushman also uh, has been a teacher at LACP and will be again. And he began experimenting with digital imagery in the early 1990s. And his are really incredible. This is from his Hopper series. Um, he actually makes uh, little miniature models of the of the backrooms and backgrounds and the rooms. So everything you see is actually a miniature. Uh, it's a dollhouse size photograph in the background and probably the table that these people are stand, sitting around. And then he photographs models and puts them into this uh, scene that he's created. So Luis Gonzalez de Palma is also one of my favorites and uh, he's from Guatemala. He uses film newsprint uh, in his collage work. And I don't know quite how he does this actually. Uh, I was looking at these today and trying to figure this out. I know he prints in the darkroom, he sepia tones images, but I don't know quite how he got the newsprint to be behind it or whether it's a translucent piece of film, I'm not sure. I do know with these, he sort of made these boxes and he's painted with gold leaf. He uses gold leaf a lot and he uses paint as well. This is more recent, which is sort of more traditional collage. As a, uh, so it's got pieces of paper, photographs that he's put painted on top of. There's a piece of string down the center of it. You can see the shadow of the string. I never can produce, pronounce this artist's name, but I love her work. Uh, I will try Nizdeka Akunili Crosby. She's a Nigerian born visual artist who works in Los Angeles. She's really a painter, uh, but she uses um, photo transfers in her work. So I just wanted to show this to you. If you look sort of deeply into this photograph, you can see that there's photographs. Uh, she uses just her own photographs of her family and postcards and things like that. And she makes them into photo transfers and puts them on the canvas. I think they're really extraordinary and it's a beautiful use, not quite of collage, it's really more painting, but she is using photo collage in her paintings. And here's the last one of hers. And that's it. I have uh, some resources for you all. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and for being here. Um, so the one I talked in the beginning was playing, playing with pictures, the art of Victorian photo collage. There's a book called, it's actually the art of collage volumes one, two, and three. Uh, Dan Eldon's The Journey is the Destination. There's two films that I didn't mention the other one, but apparently there's a film about Jerry Yulesman I have not seen. There's The Secret Life of Lance Lesher. Um, there's a magazine called Photo Trouvé magazine, which you can follow on Instagram, which is super fun and shows a lot of incredible collage work. Uh, there's the Collage Club also on Instagram. There's Collage Magazine, as you can see, K-O-L-A-J, Collage Magazine. And there's also Pinterest, which is just a great uh, way to uh, find a lot of great collage. 
and I am going to stop sharing right now. So hi, everybody. <laughs> I hope you're all still alive uh, and awake. So if anybody has any questions, I see this chat has some stuff in it. I think it's all. Um, somebody says, mentioned Micheline Thomas's photo collage of the woman reclining is of Solange Knowles, a singer and sister of Beyonce. That photo collage was on Solange soul album, digital album cover. I did not know that. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Micheline Thomas's. She's really fantastic. Her work's incredible. And it's been seen all over. Again, she was huge in, in Paris Photo a couple of years ago, and the pieces are just really large. I love it. Um, Go ahead, what? I think I can actually ask you, I, you can talk, hold on, go ahead. Oh no, I was just like, I was just thanking you. I, I like when you flashed that photo up, I was like, oh yeah, I've seen that before. It was on one of her albums. I got the album name wrong though, it's on the true album. But when you flashed that photo up, I was like, oh my God, I've seen that. I love that photo too. I love that collage. Oh yeah, me too. Um, somebody else asked, when using others' photographic images, when is it a, co a copyright issue? I think that's a really good question. Um, I'm not a copyright expert, but I can tell you what I do know. So I do a lot of photo collage myself. I try to always use my own photographs or photographs that are out of copyright, which is to say copyright is the artist's life plus 70 years, I think, or 75 years. So, um, but anything basically made over a hundred years ago is pretty much fair game. Um, you can probably think that they're not gonna come after you, but um, in newspapers and magazines, people use a lot of those in their collages now. And those are other people's photographs, but they've cut them up enough. There's, there's this gray area. So with copyright, it's if you've changed the original uh, piece of art enough to give it a new meaning, you can use it. So, uh, it's something, it's a percentage of the total image or the total that you've used or something like that. So a lot of people do use magazines um, and uh, photographs by famous people. I tend to, to steer away from them. Uh, do we have any other questions that anybody wants to ask? I can actually. Yeah, um, I, it's Sandy, hi. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I, I love your uh, collage work, and I was wondering not to put you on the spot. You pass if you will, if you like to just hear about your your approach to it. Sure. Do you, are you talking about the collages, like the actual collages, or the photo montages that I do, or both? I, I guess I, I'm. I know you do both, and I, I guess I was initially, I, and I love both. But initially, I was asking about the photo montages that you do. So um, I started doing photo montage maybe, um, yeah, five, five or six years ago. I, I've been using Photoshop for a long time. Um, and for me, it was really that I kind of got tired of the still image. I don't know, I wanted to expand a little bit and I wanted some to tell a story with a more complex meaning. So I started just compositing images together in Photoshop. Um, I don't know what to tell you about it. It's a really uh, long process is what I would say uh, of just experimentation trying to use images that you find or that you personally find interesting and that you think will work together because uh, they don't always. I have hundreds that are like in process because I really like them, but they haven't quite kind of gelled or come together um, in the right way. So I'm always impressed when I see other people's work that does gel or come together really, really beautifully. One of the things I've know, noticed about you yours is that, uh, is that it doesn't, um, when you first see it, you you think that some some of them, not all of them, but when you first see them, you sometimes think they're actual a, a single an image, maybe a reflection or a, that a, is that that's something that your 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 preference you're going for it depends on the image. No, um, I think that is I, something I realized sort of after a little while that um, probably the best images were ones where people didn't immediately know that it was a collage. Sometimes you can see images you know, and you can, you've all seen photographs and they're great of like, you know, half of a woman and half of something else or something like that. And you know, immediately that it's a composite of two images. And I guess with mine, again, I was trying to create scenes where you didn't immediately know. And one of the things I did realize is that reflection is a great way to do that because in reflections, you often see two images together and your brain just automatically says, oh, that's just a reflection of whatever's on the street. So you don't know that it's actually a photo collage. 
Um, so that was something I was trying for. It's again, really hard, <laughs> I would say. That's why I only have about 25 and I've been working on them for five years, so. Right, and you, and you paint on some of yours as well, correct? I do now. So now I've gotten into actual collage where I'm painting a little bit on photographs and using paintings in my collages and doing more of the gluing down and ripping and that sort of stuff. So now I've kind of moved into that sphere as well. And in those, I know that you know it's photo collage right off the bat, but I'm still, um, you know, I look at somebody like Katrian de Blauer and I love that work and I, you know immediately that it's a couple of different images put together, but she's done it so seamlessly that it just seems like they were meant to be together or that it's just such a beautiful outcome of these images. Well, and sometimes she had, but, but you, you and she have in common that you have these kind of contradictions that play off of each other. Um, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, I, I love the work. Thank you, Thank for, you. for talking about it. Uh, my website is in the chat if anybody wants to check out more of my work. And also I have work on Instagram. So you're welcome to check, check that out. Um, any tips on archival glues? Yes. You know, somebody, wait, I'm just going to look down this. I was just talking to a friend about glues the other day and she reminded me. So I'm just going to look this up really quickly. Okay. Here we go. So what you want to use is archival glue. Very important. You use archival glue because if you sell it to a collector and it turns green or yellow, whatever, it's not going to be good. So uh, there's something called golden matte medium that you can use. You can use matte medium to glue things down. You can use, uh, I have an archival glue that I got from, I can't think of what's the name of the place, but if you look up archival glues, um, Bostick and, Bostick and Sullivan, I think that's where I got it. They sell archival glue. Um, there's something called Yes, which is just like a glue that's called Yes. I can't remember why it's called Yes, but that's the brand name of it. And um, there's also an Uhu stick, which is like a glue stick, but it's archival. So um, whatever you use, I would just make sure that it says archival on it. Um, as I said, otherwise it will turn your pictures different colors. And you really just have to experiment. Gluing can be just a pain in the butt is what I'm gonna tell you. Um, so you might have a couple of different images that you are gonna try it out on first, because sometimes the glue comes out really fast. Sometimes it buckles the picture and then you have to sort of try to flatten it down. Um, I can't say that I'm an expert on any of this. I generally just try a lot of experimenting. I kind of work on images in Photoshop and then when I go to glue them, I get them all together to glue and then I work on a lot of them in one day. And actually I have a roller. I have like one of those little mini paint rollers that I roll the glue sometimes on the back. But you have to make sure that you're putting that on a separate piece of paper every time so that when you, your fingers don't get all gluey and you don't get, it just, yeah. I'm just gonna tell you, I've ruined lots of pictures, but you know, you can always print another one. So I hope that helps. Anything else from anybody? Any questions about anything I went over? I know it was a lot. Okay, we're gonna have quiet here. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for spending the afternoon, the evening with me and uh, learning a little bit about, more about photo collage. I'm happy to answer any questions. Just email me or my emails on my website or find me on Instagram and message me if you have any questions and uh, thank you.